Thank you for joining us today here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, where we're joined by some of the brightest political minds. We're going to take a step back from the day-to-day -day punditry and really examine what's ahead of the presidential primary season. I'm joined here by David Brady, Deputy Director of the Hoover Institution and Senior Fellow. Also, Tammy Frisbee, a Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution, who teaches political science at Stanford. And Mo Fiorina, Professor of Political Science and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Thank you for joining us today. This has been quite an unconventional presidential primary so far. We've had three early elections with three different outcomes. And now we have Mitt Romney, who has won Florida, a delegates take all state. Um, so now what does that mean for the race? Well, I think it means that he's the favored. Uh, I uh, going uh, going down the road, he's the favorite. He's got more money. He's better organized. He's in the states. Uh, I've always considered this a campaign where it was king of the hill, where first it was Michelle Bachman, and then Kane, and then Perry, and they came and go, and Gingrich came and he went. But uh, I, the problem was that Mr. Romney was only halfway up the hill. His support level was always about 30, so even though he had some pretty significant wins in New Hampshire and a good win in Florida, national polls still show him as about, at about 30 percent. So I don't think the victory in Florida is going to get Newt Gingrich. It's certainly not going to get Ron Paul out. And given the way the Republicans have set their convention up, I, I consider we're going to be going well into uh, April and May before we have a winner. Mo, well, why is this? Why do we have uh, you know, so many different outcomes? Why are, is the electorate so indecisive? Well, I think, first of all, we're, we're not talking about the electorate. We're talking about Republican primary voters for the most part, plus some independents in the open primary states. And see, these are the most active, involved, knowledgeable, concerned uh, voters out there. And the fact is the Republican Party is very factionalized uh, these days. We have the economic conservatives and the libertarians. We have the social conservatives, the national security conservatives. And nobody's particularly happy with the candidates who are not, actually, they're not even concerned with their own faction. They're not even that happy with their own people. And so uh, as I expect, like David said, this to go on for a while yet. There are a lot of people who seem intent on closing it down. And while I would think Romney is the single most likely person at this point, I think the, uh, it's going to take a long time before he clinches it, if ever, that uh, the primaries and caucuses coming up are still primarily proportional. Uh, we'll have to see if Newt Gingrich can, how he does on Super Tuesday in the southern states. And so I'm not, uh, I wouldn't bet a whole lot of money on Romney yet. Is there a historical precedent for this? I think 76, uh, Reagan took on uh, sitting President Gerald Ford, though he was unelected. The election uh, went right down to the wire. Uh, even it was the first ballot at the convention where we actually knew that Ford was going to win. But uh, early on, Ford won the early primaries, but then they moved into North Carolina, was the first primary that Reagan took. And as they moved through the South, uh, he, he did very well. Now, I don't think that's the case this year because Reagan had been governor of California and had a long, solid base, but there is a precedent for it running this late. Reagan also had a, a well organized national campaign and major funding. Of course, Gingrich's super PACs can help him out on that front, but I don't think Gingrich is playing this, the same level right now that, that Reagan did. And it, you also have to consider that Gingrich isn't even on the ballot in some key states. He's not on the ballot in Virginia, for example. So uh, I like the line that Gingrich wants to recapture the spirit of 1976, of 76, but I think while it's not impossible, it's going to be difficult. We've seen a different role in debates, I think, this season. Um, do you think that has had an impact on the elections? I think it has, but I suspect it's probably exaggerated. Uh, that again, the, despite the fact that the, the debates have set records for viewership, it is still a relatively small proportion of the population, although it is a larger proportion of the people who are actually voting in the primaries. Uh, but I think the, the tendency of people in the commentariat is to interpret everything in terms of day-to-day uh, -day events, strategy, tactics, personalities. And I think we as academics tend to put a lot more emphasis on broader forces and underlying conditions. And we see these other things as more marginal uh, ups and downs in how they affect the race. I, I agree with that. It's uh, uh, very more comments about how Wolf Blitzer did. Wolf did great with well, this question. They replay those questions. And in the long run, it's not those debates that are going to make the difference. It's an uh, organization. If you look at the Florida victory, it's uh, attributable to the amount of money in the ads and I think the unbelievable number of uh, the, the gap that Gingrich had among women voters. It was just huge. 
And I think it had very little to do with what he said in the debate. The analogy I like to use is the stock market. You know, you tune in during the day and they say, okay, the market is down 100 points on Greece, Greece woes. And then a little later you tune in, they say the market is up 50 points on a strong Apple earnings report. <laughs> and that's the way the polls are. They just sort of say, look at that, and they say, well, it must have been the debate, you know. And, so. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we now have two other candidates really hanging on, and no, no indication of dropping out of the race. What is the effect of both of those? We'll start with uh, Ron Paul. That is certainly Professor Fiorini. <laughs> he, he has a yeah. Ron Paul bobblehead doll on his desk, so he is the man. Well, I think, uh, first of all, Ron Paul will continue to rack up delegates, not in large numbers, but the more that he takes, then the larger proportion that a Romney or a Gingrich would have to take to win a, a majority. That's one thing. And there's also the outside possibility that Ron Paul, uh, his people could run him on a third party ticket. Uh, he declined to do that last time, but he has done it in the past. We also have out there America elect, by the way, and they're not accruing delegates, but it's also another wild card. Uh, that you could conceivably have a four, four per, I mean, we always have eight or nine people because we always have these sort of really fringe candidates, but you could have a, a libertarian like Paul, you could have an America elect, a bipartisan centrist type thing, and then you could have the two candidates. It's a possibility. As a political scientist interested in exciting campaigns, I, I would love that. As a, as a citizen concerned for the country, I'm not sure what the <laughs> outcome of that would be. Uh -huh. Where do you think, uh, whose votes are Ron Paul, is Ron Paul pulling? <sighs> I think in the general election, it could be all for both sides. And Ron Paul is strong among young people who are really attracted to his non-interventionist foreign policy and his relatively liberal views on things like drugs, sex, and so forth. And, uh, and that detracts from Democrats, obviously. But then uh, his views on the economy uh, detract from Republicans. And so I think Ron Paul is not just, you can't, I think the Republicans are making a mistake if they say, if Ron Paul gets out of the race, we get all their votes. I don't think that's true. And what about Rick Santorum? Right now, I th think his vote's probably split. Uh, the Gingrich camp wants to say that if Santorum gets out, then they would pick up those votes, right, and then they would have been running neck and neck with Romney in Florida. Um, Rick Santorum pulls a particular kind of social conservative that isn't going to isn't going to vote for Newt Gingrich and his three wives. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. So let's take a look what this protracted uh, primary sort of means for the general. Um, is this, you know? good for the party because it gives more time to really prepare their candidate? Is it bad because they're fractured? What, what are those implications? I don't think we have any uh, real real evidence on, on this in, in the following way. So what, one argument is that, of course, it's the uh, during the primary, the Democratic side, you get politics on the left, and on the Republican side, you get it on the right. It's a Republican year, so that's what we got. The independent voters are going to decide this election, just like they went for Obama in 2008, then Republican in 2010. And independents, we know, are not uh, guaranteed to go Republican. On some issues, uh, like cutting spending, they favor uh, the Republican side. But on issues like increasing taxes and other issues like education, they're on the Democratic side. And candidates matter. And here, here's the crucial thing for the Republicans. Uh, there are more Democrats than Republicans, so Romney, the best candidate the Republicans have thus far is Romney, who splits the independent vote. That's not good enough. Democrats have a edge in terms of party identification, so Republicans got to really win the independent. So the question is, will those independent, with a campaign and its nastiness, permanently affect independent voters against Romney, uh, or uh, will this, will it, will this, uh, the long debate strengthen him? I don't think we have an answer to that. In 2008, people said, oh, it benefited Obama because he was organized in these key states where uh, it might may, if it was been a closer election, it made a difference. On the other hand, the, the last set of primaries that he lost to Hillary Clinton, he lost precisely that white, white blue-collar vote, white blue-collar vote that he didn't really get back till the very end of the campaign. So I, I don't think we have, uh, it's those two arguments. I don't think we know the answer to that. It almost seems like there is a, a, a tide of sort of losing interest in the current, you know, President Obama, I think polling sort of indica indicates that, yet there's not a real excitement about the candidate. Um, is this really kind of the president's race to lose, or? I, th I think it is probably the president's race to lose. Um, obviously, the general background conditions are very unfavorable. Uh, to the president. Uh, on the other hand, I think he, 
he's somewhat like Jimmy Carter. He enjoys a, um, a high degree of personal respect and personal affection, as Carter did, even when people thought Carter was doing a terrible job. They thought he was a peach of a guy, excuse the pun. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and I think it's somewhat the same with Obama. And the fact that Republicans um, really, as people say, that their A-team is on the bench, that the, the people we really expected to see the Republican candidate coming from, uh, they're not there in the race right now. And so he's benefiting, I think, from a weak Republican field, and I wouldn't bet against him right now. Why, why is that A-team on the bench, and who do you think that A-team would be? Well, politicians are strategic. They know this is going to be a tough election. It's been a hard few years with the economy, but we have, if not robust, um, sustained marginal economic growth, right? The economy is growing at between 2 and 3 percent a quarter. And so if you're looking at what's likely to happen and you think that maybe you have some years ahead of you, right? Mitch Daniels is a fairly young guy, right? Chris Christie is a young guy. Jeb Bush is, what, 58. So th this would be a good year for him, but he could wait four years. And so you look out and you say, well, if Obama wins in four more years of Obama, then we have a, a, a wide open field. And so I think they're, they're waiting. Uh, I'll just to add to that. I, I think uh, I think that's exactly right. But the, the one I had a, the other day, it struck me that uh, the old days the Democrats had the problem unless they nominated a Carter or a uh, Clinton, who was more to the center, they didn't do very well. And so for the so if you say who is the Republican A team, well that seems to me like Chris Christie, it, uh, pe people uh, like that. And wh why aren't why isn't Chris Christie running? Why didn't he run when people came to him with the money? I, I think he looked out there and thought of a primary. He, you know, he's the governor of New Jersey. Uh, he's tough on spending, but he was pro. Uh, he's not anti. Uh, he's not not totally pro-life enough for the Republican primaries. He's certainly not anti-immigration enough for the Republican primaries. And I think they're thinking about looking at that. And how do I? Uh, how do I? Uh, I'm okay for November, but now running in February and March, I think that's tougher, and that that adds to the problem. And they can wait. Uh, they can wait four years, so uh, I agree. I, but I do think that's a problem. The Republican Party split, like Mo says, and that means the primary pulls you in a direction that you might not want to go. And for governors like Christie and that, they're all they're more moderate. We're talking about the party being split. You know, a lot of politicians are talking about how polarized voters are. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Nearly everything you read about polarization in the media is wrong. <laughs> uh, or at least incomplete or misinterpreted. Uh, I mean, it's the, the electorate is not nearly as split as the activists, the politicians out there. Uh, people who vote in the primaries are more split than people who are just going to tune in come general election time. Sure. The, uh, the parties are split, but the electorate itself isn't split. The Democrats and Republicans are farther apart, but people in the whole are fleeing from the parties. Forty percent of the people are choosing the independent label in all the recent polls. And so I think, in fact, I think the country is sick of polarization, at least a large part of it, that they think Washington is not working. They see both parties drawing lines in the sand. Republicans won't take $10, $10 in cuts for every dollar in, in revenue increases. And most people think that's a pretty reasonable bargain, if you ask them. And they want, to see, they want to see some progress made on the problems that face us all. And they see a political system that is simply gridlocked and not making any progress.